There's a certain type of video game that I find absolutely fascinating. I'm talking about those games that come out here and there, presumably out of nowhere, and are able to capture a feeling very few others can. It's games set in melancholy spaces, games in places shrouded in fog, set in abandoned lost towns, games in dead empty worlds, and games where you can sense something just off in a distance is watching. Almost a year ago, I made a video about this exact subject and feeling. We explored worlds of emptiness, worlds of decay and death, uncanny and psychological explorations of the human psyche, and the intense fear of empty spaces, bringing back that same feeling of walking through that foggy, cursed town. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. But the original Silent Hill game captures this effect perfectly. Its dreamlike visuals, music, tone, and world setting creates a still to this day unmatched atmosphere where the whole game feels like some sort of dream. And that's not even touching the hidden underworld of Silent Hill. Its deep lore, occult references, and secret metaphors. It's a masterpiece of its genre, and in my opinion, has even gone beyond and created its own. While many call something like that horror, for me there's something more to it. A certain level of peacefulness when exploring such places, giving off the sense of being the only one left alive in a dead empty world. That video I made resonated with many, and I wanted to revisit this topic, coming back once again and experiencing more surreal, empty, dystopian, and desolate worlds. More worlds to explore more worlds to get lost in. Dans mes rêves agités, cette ville m'apparaît. If you didn't know what that meant, that's because that was in French. And as someone who speaks multiple languages and had lived in multiple countries, it can be really difficult to keep up. Especially when living in places where you don't have the privilege of using all your languages, this can cause you to quickly lose the ability. Because when it comes to language, you either use it or lose it. And that is why this video is sponsored by Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. Its intuitive lessons help you to learn a language through real-life conversations, through lessons designed by real-language teachers. Babbel not only helps you retain and grow the languages you already speak, but enables you to learn new ones with their simple and effective real-world conversational lessons that prepare you to have practical conversations as soon as possible. In fact, it's been so effective that research studies at Yale and Michigan State found that complete beginners needed only 15 hours of total study time to cover the requirements for one college semester. If you break that down into study hours per day, that's about 15 minutes of study time. Statistically, it has never been easier to learn a new language, thanks to Babbel. And take it from me, it's something definitely worth pursuing. So, sign up to Babbel now and get 60% off on your subscription with two free live classes as well as a 20-day money-back guarantee by heading down to the link in the description below. Un grand merci à Babel and let's get right back to our video. That Which Gave Chase is an experimental, narrative-driven, dark sledding thriller set in the vast, dead-frozen wastes of the Arctic. You play as a dog sled musher, tasked with bringing a strange scientist back to his previously abandoned expedition. It is up to us to chart our course through this frozen wasteland, dealing with its natural elements and wildlife. The game drops you off right into the world without much exposition or context on why you are here or of what to do. We find ourselves on a dark snowy trail in the middle of nowhere. Our slut dogs are resting and the stranger we are transporting is standing there waiting for us. We walk up to him and all he says is, 
we should keep moving. We pet our dogs and set off on our journey. The game explains to us the simple controls of our sled and gives us full control from this point onwards. Forgive my impatience. I have placed a lot of trust in you. Wish I didn't have to, but my hand is forced. Time will show if you're the right person for the job. It was a fortunate thing for both of us that I found you when I did. I can tell you are determined, willing to brave the cold when few others would. Your efforts will not go unnoticed. There is something that persists throughout most of this game, where we aren't told what our mission is or the purpose for this mysterious expedition, except for bringing the strange scientist deeper and deeper into the Arctic. He hints at things in cryptic ways and speaks about his previously abandoned mission. I think much will come of this. It is time for me to return, to finish the work I have started. But as we'll get to see, whatever he has planned is darker and stranger than what we could have possibly imagined. In terms of gameplay, the game actually has more to it than what it first seems. For starters, the game uses a physics-based sliding system that has us both controlling the speed of the dogs as well as our turn rate and tilts, which you can imagine gets pretty difficult at certain points when the environment is a bit uneven. Lose control of the sled and you come crashing down. We eventually make it over the mountain, and we are told that the cabin should be close. We pull up to a tiny wooden cabin, anchor ourselves, and prepare to head inside. But the game jump cuts us to a different point in time, as we follow the stranger up a mountain on foot. Remember that this is just the first step. All your efforts up to this point will be matched twofold or worse. This is always a true test. One I have failed again and again. A bright light takes over our vision before the game cuts yet again. And we find ourselves hunting a deer. Narrative jump cuts like this are used throughout the whole game, making the entire experience and timeline of events scrambled. The scientist picks up the mushrooms that the deer was eating. Almost ruined. Their behavior remains strange to me though I understand it much better now. And the game cuts yet again to a crossroad. The path splits. We build these to serve as guideposts. You'll learn not to place much trust in your senses here. Least of all your memory. More cryptic and strange comments, but we'll get on our sled and continue on trucking across the storm. Going from one signpost to the next, to figure out our own path. This area in particular seems to have a lot more deer activity than the last. It seems like we are getting closer and closer to our goal. It must be this way. I recall our first crossing out on the gray sea ice with no landmarks to guide us, hearts unyielding in the face of endless struggle. I knew the way would reveal itself to us eventually. Our guide tells us about their first time coming to this point and crossing the gray sea ice. An area with no landmarks or guides, how difficult it was, but tells us to not worry as the path will eventually reveal itself to us. We eventually make it to the last cabin before crossing the gray sea ice. Our final post of civilization to prepare before the great journey. But before we could go in, the game cuts again to nighttime. Empty. Here, your lantern. You should continue. This is no place for rest. Forced to continue on the journey well into the night, we set forth on the final mountain valley that leads us to the gray sea ice. The scientist tells us that when he came through here first, he understood very little, unlike us, and that he was the only one amongst his companions who had the courage to cross his boundary. The game opens up into an area completely flat. This place is the Seif. Pass through and you shall find all your imagined woes have been left behind. But know this, the ghosts that give chase through the gray will never leave your side, no matter how far you go.
more cryptic and creepy wording from our scientists. Then it begins. We are on the frozen sea. The game then slowly fades to black, and a blurry light source appears. Before we see that it's our scientist sitting by a fire, he asks if he already told us of what became of the deathless deer. We answer no. He tells us that his expedition was slipping through his fingers. They were being humiliated by the conditions, and all their efforts to chart a course were useless. Yet somehow, these stupid creatures were able to not just survive, but thrive. The game cuts again and we find ourselves back at the grey sea ice, stuck in a complete whiteout and lost. One thing about this game that I find really interesting, besides how mysterious it is and the cryptic nature of its narrative, is how accurate and grounded it keeps itself. From the look and feel of the snow, the conditions we find ourselves in, our gear and even down to the weather phenomena like this. Whiteouts are something that happens frequently in cold and icy places like the Arctic. It's a natural phenomena where, due to extreme heavy snowfall, the horizon line disappears from the view, while the sky and landscape appears featureless, with a lack of shadows from the diffuse lighting leaving no points of visual reference by which to navigate, and making everything around you appear as just white. This can result in some visual illusions where things can appear to almost float. And as you could imagine, this can be extremely dangerous. There are some terrifying videos online of people driving through a whiteout. The only visible thing is the few flags that stick out of the ground to mark the edge of the road. Now imagine being caught in a whiteout in a place like the Arctic regions, where you are miles and miles away from any civilization and going just slightly off course could mean being stranded and freezing to death. It's really cool that that which gave chase has this, and accurately, we find ourselves lost due to it. Thankfully though, some deer seem to have found us. We begin to follow it, as it's really the only thing we can do. Our scientist starts telling us more about these curious creatures. He tells us that on their initial journey out here, they were curious on how these animals could thrive in such an unforgiving place. So they took one from its herd and used it to guide them across the grey frozen sea. Not content with simply being led across, they were curious on how it knew which way to go. When one speculated that it maybe could hear beating hoofs across the ice, they cut off his ear yet it kept going. Then another proposed that it could see indentations in the snow, so they took out its eyes, and yet still, they emerged on the other side, and the creature was reunited with its herd. The deer knew things it could not have been taught, or used senses they couldn't take away from it. It seems like these deer have more to them than what first meets the eye, and eventually, the deer guides us out of the great sea. We make it to the first cabin on the other side of the ice sea, but the game cuts again and we find ourselves alone. Our sled is here, our dogs too, but the scientist is nowhere to be seen. Once inside we find an empty cabin, but it seems like someone left a work here that we can read. Entrance to the Eastern site, March 18th, 1892. I'm not sure what purpose my writing could serve but I still find value in it. Perhaps it is just for my own sanity. Writing helps me recall, helps me separate my own thoughts and memories from theirs. This is after all what I'm paid to do. We have all settled into our roles rather well, albeit with one glaring exception. His accounts of the North made great impact on me in my youth. So strong was the allure of the sections of the world map still uncharted that I found myself standing in port with all my belongings wrapped in cloth, I have always considered myself a careful, logical person. Yet, there I was, willing to put everything on a line to be given the chance to return with an account of my own. The crew there assembled was a curious sight. Misplaced among the five hardened expeditionists stood I, a failed writer, along with two artists and of course the ill-fated young botanist, all handpicked by our great leader a man whose name once carried some renown in certain circles. In his eyes, I saw that same light which shone so furiously in the horizon. Leading us to the first sight, 
I recall that my heart sank, for I knew that light would only ever lead further into the gray. The book ends with a giant dark circle on the last page. The ill-fated botanist, huh? Who could it be? Maybe it's our scientist. What's interesting about these writings is that we finally have a date. Now, what is really cool about this, and I'm not sure if this was done intentionally, but there are two expeditions that took place that year in real life. The Peary Expedition to Greenland and the Björling Kalstinius Expedition of 1892. The latter which sounds eerily similar to our expedition in That Which Gave Chase. In 1892, Alfred Björling, a 21-year-old adventurer and botanist, orchestrated an expedition with the ambitious goal of becoming the first to reach the North Pole. He persuaded a fellow countryman and zoologist, Ivald Kalstius, to accompany him on what was initially portrayed as a botanizing expedition to northern Greenland. They constructed a crew of five and set off on their journey in May of 1892 only two months away from the games expedition. The expedition made it as far as the easternmost of the Kerry Islands, a group of tiny islands of the coast of northern Greenland. After making a stop there, their ship ran ashore under the pressure of the drift ice and got damaged. Stranded on a Kerry Islands with no means of going south, with winter on the horizon and the hours of daylight noticeably decreasing, their only option was to get on their tiny sloop and try to make it for the Greenland coast, plainly visible to them and only about 60 kilometers away. Their logic was, if they could get there, they would get the help from the Inuit, the native tribe that lived there, to ensure their survival throughout the winter. In June of the following year, Captain Harry McKay of the Scottish whaler Aurora spotted a wreck on the easternmost of the Kerry Islands. He landed and discovered a ship embedded in the winter snow and ice and a man's body was found nearby, buried under a pile of stone. McKay quickly gathered the relics he could find, including Burling's final message. A letter which read, Forced by bad weather to linger on his island for a long time, I now set on the tour to the Eskimos, on Ellesmere Island, as I hope that a whaler will visit Kerry Island next summer to rescue me and my companions. I will try to reach this island again before June 1st. We are now five men, of which one is dying. The expedition, one man short, vanished into the west, on a tiny sloop heading vainly towards the unknown Ellesmere Island, they were never heard from again. Now while the story is very different from the one in game, there are still some things that are just too similar to ignore. The leader being a botanist, the date, and the similar ill fate. We find drawings of their expedition on the floor, surely made by their artist. But as we try to leave, we see a note on a door. For the outsider, the one who is being led, we see you too. Weird. When we go outside, we find ourselves back into the present. We continue our course, but things seem to be getting weirder. When we get to a signpost, the scientists are speaking to us in a more cryptic way. Do not worry. Here we are all bound to a script. My body unable to move. My memories no longer my own. Hinting that at this point into the journey, this deep in, he is completely under control of whatever exists beyond. The same force that guides the deer is guiding him now. The game cuts again to a campfire. He tells us, in viewing the events that led up to this moment, understand that I have been asked to play the part of the opposer, standing not in a way, but alongside it, who by ingesting poison let rot set in and replaced old flesh with new. I could tell you that I planned for this course of events to take place, but I know better than that now. Not unlike you, I am a victim of circumstance. Do not ask me to reason. The reasoning of your own mind may be as impenetrable to you as the reasoning of others. The sum of a half-remembered feeling in a long-forgotten dream. To you I was a hand in the dark. A stranger stood, waiting in a forest. I took you in, 
trod the path you followed effortlessly. Now, just as I brought you here, you will bring me up. We wake up in a cave. When we look down, we find ourselves sitting on a chair with mushrooms put into the sides of our arms. We remove one by one, and with the only choice given to us, we begin to eat. We pick up the flashlight. This place seems to be someone's home. We find a note. In my memory, I spoke to a young man there, convinced him to abandon his life and live like I did. We should be close now. I guide him as well as I can and hope you will do your part. You, who recalls everything, remember this also. I brought them here. I'm the one who should be allowed to leave. It seems like the scientist betrayed us, sacrificed us for his own freedom. But who is he talking to? And why did we have mushrooms growing out of us? We escape the cave into a dense snowstorm, following their thread marks down into a valley before they disappear. However, by eating the mushrooms, we can see visions. Our first vision is of the original expedition crew and a ghost image of where the scientists fled to. We follow them, eating mushrooms on the way. We eventually find a sled, but our dogs are missing. Scattered around the forest, we find one by one by following their howls. But we also find a final cabin in the forest. Inside, we find this. The previous victims who befell the same fate as we did, but who sadly didn't survive. On the floor we find a note, curious that the task of mapping this place befell the botanist, who prior to this excursion had barely left the confines of his hometown. His drawings mean to resemble cartography. Surely worlds and tendrils are still on his mind. The borders swirl, stretching out across the impossible sea ice, connecting each growth in a wretched web. Every day he tries to perfect his distillations hoping to be given insight into some great truth. I am patient. I will continue to review his work. On a table, multiple samples and descriptions of fungus. Northern site variant A. Everything is kept, safe from the noise of time. I have had so much time to think without arriving any closer to truth. None of us are fully lost. We are still here, content with reliving the past through its eyes. It has shown me answers to questions long forgotten. I no longer recall how to ask my own. He wishes to bring it out, to let it do there what it has done here. I don't know whether to stop him or help him. Let him rot in his cave. I prepare for one final journey and pray it leads me elsewhere or nowhere at all, not here. We leave the cabin, put our dogs back on their sled and begin our escape out of this place. But the scientist catches up to us. Picking up our weapon and beginning a gunfight in the middle of the storm, visions coming to us in strange ways as we battle our way out. As our character is still hallucinating due to the mushrooms we ate, the scientist appears to have supernatural powers. We eventually defeat him. Picking up his flask, we drink. And that is that which gave chase. I have to be honest, on my first playthrough of this game, I had no idea what was going on. 
And even after my second, I'm still having a hard time piecing everything together. It seems like whatever happened in the first expedition caused the botanist to be completely obsessed with the abilities of the fungus that grows in this area. He went insane after crossing the Great Ice Sea. As the game goes on, he is revealed to have been driven mad from the hallucinogenic mushrooms he had been consuming throughout the entire journey, giving him strange abilities similar to the animals that live here. The game's already desolate and lonely environment plays with the senses. Mixed with the jarring jump cuts, it creates a dreamlike experience making the player guess the story from its pieces. The question is, we know that the mushrooms do indeed give us powers and visions. We ate them ourselves. But there seems more to them and to this entire area, like some sort of eldritch force that manifests itself through these mushrooms. The deers eat the mushrooms and it gives them abilities to communicate with each other over vast distances. Our guide eats them and makes potions out of them throughout our trip, giving him the same ability to guide us through this empty world. As he says at the end and throughout the entire game, he is merely a vessel of something else. The ending of the game leaves much for speculation, with us seemingly surviving the whole ordeal and returning back where we came from with the corpse of the scientist. That which gave chase is a gloomy, melancholy, psychological horror experience. And it's exactly the type of game that I'm talking about. But I promise the rest of the games we will cover won't be as long or as convoluted as this one. I just felt the need to talk about this game because I personally find it extremely interesting and the game itself is very underrated for how good it is. Bob D is a game that uses its strangeness to its advantage. The game drops us off in a rundown hallway in a large concrete residential building within a small town by the name of Bobdi. Our one and only goal given to us is to find a way out of this town. The gameplay of Bobdi is exploration and platformer, with its own quirks, using different tools you find around the map to help you travel and navigate the world. You can use the bat to hit a surface and it pushes you back, or you could find a leaf blower to hover in the air for a while. We take the elevator down and make it out of the building, and looking around us, we can see the state of the town we're in. It's a maze of interconnected, gray, lifeless concrete buildings linked together with a few bridges and broken bits. Bob D is firmly brutalist in aesthetic, an architecture style that is known to induce feelings of unease and alienation. Most of the insides of the buildings are abandoned and empty, but from time to time, we can come across some lived-in apartments. The entire town of Babdi has this dreadful feeling of abandonment, a world long forgotten. By this point into the game, no information has been given to us about what Babdi even is. The only bits of info we can find is on the Steam page. It tells us Babdi is a forsaken district in the outer ring of a megalopolis, which means a very large city. This area outside of Babdi we never get to see. But what we do see is that the town is completely surrounded by large walls and a dam on the other side, almost like it's some sort of enclosed prison. The residents of this town are strange, both in their looks and mannerisms. Most of them are helpful. Some are shy. Others are too busy fishing for gutter oil. And some are just trying to make it one step at a time. Seeing the train station in the distance, we slowly make our way to it, coming across some points of interest and exploring more of the area on the way there. Once we get there, however, we enter a room with just a floating hand sitting on a desk. He informs us that there are no more tickets left. Bummer. On our way back to the town, we encounter a strange fella in the control room in a bridge connecting the dams. He tells us that they don't sell tickets here anymore, but he tells us that there was a sick woman who had a ticket, but she succumbed to her illness and died. And that perhaps, since she doesn't need it anymore, maybe we can get hers. He then gives us a device that is meant to detect any decaying corpse nearby, 
and tells us to go find her. Once we get to the apartment building where the woman was at, we can see a swarm of flies gathering and filling up the entire level, most likely from the stench of her rotting corpse, which is still there when we arrive. Her husband tells us her body decayed so quickly and that we can take her ticket since he has no need for it anymore. Now we can use his train ticket to head to the nearby train station and leave the town for good, ending the game. But Bhabdi has so much more to it. There are so many little secrets and cool hidden items in Bhabdi that one could easily miss. Like this dog that looks like it was brought to life from a child's drawing. By picking up a ball and throwing it at it, you unlock an achievement. Or this hidden church at the bottom levels with a strange looking cross. One of the cooler items, however, is this hidden pickaxe that lets you climb any surface, allowing you to climb the tallest tower in the game where you find another item that lets you literally fly. Bobdi is a very short and simple game, yet it feels special and memorable. It's an odd title with so much personality to it. It's also an eerily calming experience since there are no enemies or time limits letting you explore this concrete jungle of a town to your heart's desires. Lauren's Lure is a game set within an enormous megastructure of concrete and metal. You play as an android chasing an unknown artifact it saw in its vision many millennia ago. Leaving its home colony behind and chasing it further and further down the abyss of this megastructure, our protagonist finds himself lost within its steps. I have been lost down here for 253 years. in a place I'm not supposed to be. I need to find a ghost again before my energy core expires. It's all I have left. There is no going back. And dropping you off right into the action, Lorne's Lure plays as a parkour platformer with a climbing mechanic. It's a vertical inducing experience with large segments of the game set in these immensely large open spaces both in size and depth, making precision and well thought out routing necessary. The world of Lorne's Lure is massive and full of secrets bits of lore hidden around the map. It's a game that rewards exploration and going off the beaten path. And despite the game's limited story or narrative, it makes up for it in atmosphere. The world of Lorne's Lure is mysterious in its nature. We are never told what this megastructure is, who our protagonist is, or what he is, or what happened to this world to turn it like this in the first place. There is this bit within the starting area of the game where we find our climbing pigs. As we parkour our way down, we eventually find a corpse that sadly didn't survive its fall. Unlike us, this one seems to be human. A weird purple organic matter seems to seep out of its corpse. When we scan this site, we get this. An observer that has fallen to their death many years ago. Observers are explorers that leave their home colony to document what is outside. They return at a rate of approximately 0.23%. And the ones that do often have important findings. This one is from a foreign colony of unknown origin. There is a strange mass of mold growing through their suit. While I would love to explore this world more, right now we can only play a demo of the game. Because Lorne's Lure, unlike the other games on here, is a game that's still in active development. It's definitely a game that seems to have a lot more to it behind the scenes, and one I would love to return to in the future. A very similar game to Lorne's Lure is one called Nessance. 
Nissan's invites players into a surreal and atmospheric world as they navigate through expansive and abstract environments filled with strange architecture and mysterious structures. The megastructure of Nissan's is similar to the one in Lorne's Lure in terms of scale, aesthetic, and inspiration. It's a journey filled with exploration, platforming, and puzzle-solving challenges. But as we delve deeper into the surreal landscapes, we encounter vast, abstract environments so large they leave us questioning the origins of this world. Nissan's world doesn't really make much sense. From expensive vistas to claustrophobic corridors, some paths are straightforward, others seeming too small or incomplete, and some loop in on themselves in ways that don't make much sense. The world of Nissan's feels like it wasn't made for humans based on its scale and odd planning, but it is filled with human-sized doors, stairways, hallways, and if you look hard enough, living spaces. There are segments we reach towards the latter half of the game that seem like entire cities, buildings with windows, doors, and even ventilation. Yet despite this, Nissan's world is dead. You can spend the entire playthrough of the game traveling and exploring the world as far as the game lets you and find no sign of life. Yet the world reacts to us. This mega structure seems to have a consciousness of its own as lights move and flicker, blocks shift, and machinery continues to run, adding to the unsettling feeling of being watched and followed. The world seems to be void of life yet still runs and operates on its own. Nissan's really feels like some sort of end of the world scenario, a creation of some insanely powerful artificial intelligence, like something out of the world of I have no mouth and I must scream. Towards the end of the game, we reach a part where we have to cross a large bridge looming over a vast expanse. And this area is so large that condensation seems to have created clouds and lightning a raging storm within the enclosed megastructure, as nature seems to rebel against the confines of this artificial space. I absolutely love games that are set in places like this, spaces that are thought-provoking just based on the state of the world itself, inviting exploration and contemplation of existential questions. Both Nissan's and Lorne's Lure were heavily inspired by a lesser-known piece of dystopian science fiction. Not a game, but surprisingly, a Japanese manga by the name of Blame. Blame is set in an otherworldly setting, yet a world eerily similar to the one in the Suns. In an incredibly far off future where humanity had evolved technologically beyond what most science fiction works depict. Set in a world that's been entirely encompassed by an ever expanding cityscape that has grown to take over the entire planet and beyond. Blame's story takes place thousands of years after these events. We follow a human simply known as Killy on his journey to find a human with a net terminal gene. Having achieved another step in evolution through cybernetics, most humans in Blame's world could hardly be considered so in our own. Their bodies have biological, have machine. They possess extraordinarily long lifespans, some able to regenerate themselves fully, and can even upload their own consciousness to live on after their own bodies deteriorate. One such technology that allows humanity to reach such heights is something called the NetSphere. A hyper-evolved version of the internet, the NetSphere was created by humans to solve all worldly problems. These ancient humans could interact with the NetSphere using a specific gene within their DNA called the Net Terminal Gene, and created anything they possibly imagined in the real world from a digital template. But in dystopian sci-fi fashion, something goes wrong, and before they know it, the Net Terminal Gene in most humans goes extinct. Since humans could no longer connect to the NetSphere, they were left powerless stuck within their own creation. As time passed, and with no new instructions, the large machines that constructed the city, known simply as the Builders, were left to roam and build continuously. As thousands of years passed, they became erratic and senile, 
continuing to build a city layer over layer. Strata on top of strata, composed of nothing but columns, corridors, stairways, masses of pipes, doors going to nowhere, and broken machinery. However, the humans aren't alone in this world either. A new life form had emerged mysteriously, silicon life. Organisms whose genomes are built from silicon instead of carbon, making them unique from every other organism to have lived on Earth. While humans don't vary much on appearance, silicon life on the other hand does. At times appearing more human, other times more like cyborgs or monstrosities. Navigating the desolate expanse of the city, driven by the one quest, Blame is a manga unlike any other, as in it applies a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Therefore Blame is a manga full of pages and pages worth of beautifully depicted shots of the city, with very few words spoken in between. It's one of those books that you just can't help but feel lost in every time you open. The city engulfs you just like it does with its characters, as the entire story is told here. There is no other place other than the city. The true size of it is unknown, but it is believed that by this point in the manga, it has already engulfed the entire planet and expanded even beyond, having already engulfed the entire moon and perhaps even more. And as far as the earth itself, it's been long gone, mined fully by the machines. In fact, most humans don't remember what the world was like before the city. There's truly only the city now. Because of that, and because our characters are able to live for so long, the timescales of blame are enormous. At times, a simple walking sequence within the manga could take us a few page flips, but in reality, it took years, decades even, for Kelly to walk from the first point to the next. Journeys across a single chapter could take hundreds of years. Kelly also has a weapon, a small pistol called a gravitational beam emitter, a small yet incredibly powerful weapon. Its kind are the only ones able to penetrate the megastructure itself. The knowledge to make such a weapon, however, has long been lost to time, making them extremely rare to come by. As we follow Killy on his journey, all we get are these large panels of environments that span hundreds and hundreds of miles visible in any direction, encountering strange walking creatures, tie corridors, and hallways that resemble mazes. There is this part towards the end of the manga where Killy has been walking for an undisclosed period of time. Climbing up a long tunnel, Killy eventually finds a small exit that emerges into a whole city, but with no sign of life. As Killy walks long bridges that connect the complex together, he eventually finds a dark tunnel with a voice calling for him. It's a corpse but the sounds are coming from a device. A small device resembling a thumb drive with the inscriptions on it, Mori. Turns out Mori is an emergency preservation pack, a device that's meant to contain someone's consciousness as a sort of backup. Kelly and Mori then walk for an undisclosed amount of time. They eventually find a spiral staircase. Killy uses his vision to try and see the true height of it and figures that there is an exit at the end, some 3,000 kilometers away. They climb the staircase, taking breaks in between. When they eventually make it up, Killy finds a lever, cranks it, and opens a thick circular door. He emerges into a dark hallway 
Making it up a few flights of stairs, he finds a regular looking door. After opening it, Kelly emerges on the roof of a strange building like structure. But when he looks around him, he finds himself surrounded by a void. So large that neither his incredible vision nor Mori's sensors are able to measure its limits. Then a voice speaks to them. How rare, says a large figure looking into a strange device. I've been observing here for a long while, but this is the first time I've met a biological entity. Something falls down from the void, causing a big boom. The observer says that this is the crepid structural parts falling, something that happens here a lot. The observer then says that this area is a spherical space with an average diameter of 143,000 kilometers and that the construction is still ongoing. He theorizes that this space must have been for some raw material that was stored here and eventually mined out fully by the city since this area has enormous production facilities and builders around it. This number given to us here, 143,000, isn't just a random size. It's actually the exact diameter of the biggest planet in our solar system, the gas giant Jupiter. And it's believed that the city, the world that Blame is set in, is so large that it has outgrown Earth by so much that it began expanding into the entire solar system, slowly engulfing planet by planet and using them as raw material for further construction of the city. In fact, as it is well assumed that by this point, the entire solar system has already been consumed by this megastructure. The world of Blame is unbelievably huge and has one of the most interesting visions of a potentially dystopian future, proposing the potentially catastrophic scenario of what AI mixed with self-replicating machines could result in. But bringing us out of the darkness of the world of Blame, there is another world, much smaller in scale, that I want to talk about. Lighter is a new Gmod game mode created by modder Data on the Steam Workshop. It's a simple addition to the already eerie game that lets you experience the world in a completely new way, encompassing any world you load into in complete darkness and giving you the simple tool, a LiDAR, as the only way to view the world around you. LiDAR in real life is a remote sensing method that uses light itself to measure distances to objects. It works by sending out laser pulses and then measuring when it hits an object. This information helps create detailed 3D maps of the object's surroundings such as terrain, buildings, and vegetation. And similar to that, we can use our own LiDAR in-game to create a sort of 3D scan, an afterimage of the geography or mesh of our world. With two modes, one that is active and resembles more a flashlight, in this mode we can control how wide or narrow we want our beam to be, or a scan mode, which takes more time and it gives us a much more complete picture of what is in front of us. It's a super interesting concept and a breath of fresh air in Gmod game modes. But as we'll get to see, things aren't as simple as they first seem. We aren't alone here. Catching you completely off guard, LiDAR quickly turns from a cool new gimmick to a horror game. Realizing that the only way to see around us is by continuing to scan, as what we see is only a ghost figure of the world. Everything you see is a scan from the past, meaning there is no real way to view the world in real time. It has the need for you to keep perpetually scanning to get the latest and updated view of what is in front of you and the figure continues to appear to us, following us around. LiDAR uses our own visual limitations against us, and just by using the simple thought of knowing that something else is sharing this world with us creates its horror. For the rest of the game, the figure doesn't attack us, in fact the game loop kinda ends here. 
we run around the map, scanning and catching the shadow figure from time to time. It's a really cool way of creating horror with such simple means, leaving the rest of it to our minds and our own imagination. You know, come to think of it now, players do always say that they feel like they are being watched when playing Gmod maps alone. What if this is a manifestation of that? An invisible character that's always been following us around, watching us, but we just never could see it, scan it, until now. I particularly like the fact that LiDAR tricks you into downloading the game mod without even knowing what it really is. Its description on the Steam Workshop page reads, Experimental game mode. No goals, just the ability to scan a map. The only hint within the entire page that gives us any clue that there could be something more is the last image. Within it, a red figure stands alone on a lonely hill. By never promoting itself as anything other than a simple visual change, LiDAR has the powerful element of surprise. You come for the novelty of the gimmick, and before you know it, you're playing a horror game. It's a really cool way to capture that dreadful horror, removing your ability to see and giving you a limited tool that only gives you a scan of what was there the moment you click the button. But the thing is, what is LiDAR, really? Is it just a horror game or is there something more to it? What is or who is a figure? And what happens to this world to encompass it in such complete darkness? Why does the figure seem to completely absorb light, unlike any other object in the world? Questions like this flared up in my mind as soon as I saw the shadow figure. LiDAR doesn't really have a story or an objective to it. But its simplicity and its horror reminds me of another game that uses similar yet basic tricks to convey absolute terror through limited vision. Beginning at descent. Cruising depth in roughly 40 seconds. Stand by. Um, I'm seeing some voltage irregularities in the instruments, so keep an eye out for sparks or flames or anything like that. Approaching maximum depth. Uh, the hole's feeling it, but it's still holding strong. Closing porthole shielding. We're starting to lose radio signal. You'll be at cruise depth soon, so risk and be careful. You're on your own. Good. Sent on an exploration mission deep underneath the oceans of a strange alien moon in an unknown sector of space. Iron Lung is a game set entirely within a claustrophobic submarine navigating the presumably dead underworld of a planet's oceans. We are a convicted criminal, sent out on this dangerous mission as a form of punishment and redemption, tasked with navigating to points of interest and gathering data through photos. But it seems like there's something else down here with us. Iron Lung is a game that uses simple yet universal fears to create its horror. The fear of the deep oceans, the fear of limited vision, and the fear of the unknown. And similar to LiDAR, our only way to view the world around us here is by a slow, limited, and delayed photo capture using our black and white grainy front-facing camera. Which means you will spend the entirety of the game maneuvering solely based on the ship's built-in coordinates display, proximity sensors, alongside a map given to us. As you could imagine, this creates a gaming experience unlike any other and makes you rely on the atmosphere, the sounds, the photos you take, and the small bits of pieces of lore given to you to build the world around you. But what makes Iron Lung truly special is the fact that the game goes beyond using these common fears, but elevates the whole experience into a whole other scale by bringing a cosmic horror aspect to this world. On the back side of the submarine, there are other things in here we can look at. We find a piece of paper on the floor. It's a note. It reads, This is not an expedition. It is an execution. When they put you in here, they don't want you to return. 
And even if you do, and even if they keep their promises, what freedom waits for you? If you die in ships in a sea of dead stars, if there is still hope, it lies beyond the veil. Hope in this void is as illusionary as a starlight. I will choose to breathe my last at the bottom of the ocean, unseen, unheard, uncontrolled. They will get their execution. I will get my freedom. The note seems to be from an unknown previous convict who found himself in a similar predicament as us. But choosing to take control of their own fate in their last few moments, they chose death down here rather than a potential for a normal life up there. One thing that we can also find back here is a terminal. This seemingly insignificant addition to the game can give us great insights on the world of Iron Lung and of what exists beyond this ocean. By interacting with it, it tells us a briefing of our mission. Two weeks ago, we conducted an exploration of Moon 85 for the first time since the Quiet Rapture, leading to the discovery of a fourth blood ocean. A trench beneath the ocean's surface has several points of interest. Your task is to photograph these points of interest with your submarine's forward-facing camera. Since you cannot navigate by sight, pay attention to your navigation and consult the map. And that's the thing that I've been keeping from you this entire time. What makes this moon special and the reason why we were sent down here in the first place is that the oceans of this moon were found to be made of blood. In fact, three other moons were found with similar anomalies. The appearance of blood oceans on barren moons is something that began happening after this incident known as the Quiet Rapture. By using special commands, we get a variety of information and pieces of knowledge from the terminal, some of it classified, but enough to start forming an image. We start off by asking it perhaps the biggest question on our minds, what is the Quiet Rapture? It tells us that in the year 357 EIC, which is the in-game calendar, Without any prior warnings, radio contact with all respective planets was suddenly cut. Nobody could recall having visual contact with any planets when the incident occurred, or experiencing any other unusual phenomena. Upon further investigation, it was observed independently by several stations that, where there had previously been planets, nothing remained. Further investigations over the following months revealed that all known planets with sentient life flora and fauna, a habitable atmosphere, or any sort of natural resource were likewise gone. Along with all known stars, the only celestial bodies that have been found since are either uninhabitable moons or asteroids. Many theories have been proposed for this disaster, including religional interpretations of it as a literal rapture, some unknown quiet anomaly, or something more cosmic and sinister. But there are no concrete answers yet. The Quiet Rapture is the main event in Iron Lung that sets the stage for the events in the game. It was basically a cosmic scale event that took place in a fraction of a second and ended before anyone could even notice. All life, habitable planets, and stars were snapped out of existence. Now the few humans that are left behind in this void were the few who were in outer space, on space stations, or in starships. Now, these last few surviving humans must find a way to live in an already dead universe, led by the ghost light of the already gone stars. The world of Iron Lung is slowly being engulfed in darkness as the stars, one by one, vanish from the night sky. That's what makes this game extremely cool and special. It sets you off on an already terrifying mission that by itself is more than enough to scare anyone. But the game then sets up a stage for you to learn more about the world you exist in. And a more daunting realization sets in when you realize that this mission is the least of your worries. Maybe this is why the previous convict decided to live his last few days down here rather than go back up there. Just the potential implications of something like the Quiet Rapture brings up so many questions in my head. If all living things are gone, and also the things that could help support life or lead to life re-emerging again in the far future like habitable planets, stars, and resources, but not the celestial bodies like asteroids or barren moons, this suggests perhaps a level of intelligence or awareness in this occurrence. 
Almost like the universe or something did it on purpose. Is it perhaps divine intervention? Or like the entry said, something more cosmic and sinister? So many questions and so much intrigue created by so little. We get off the terminal and set off on our mission. The game gives us 10 points of interest to go to. After navigating to our first point of interest, we position ourselves correctly and snap a picture. It's a pile of pillars. Nothing special here, it seems, so we keep on moving. Navigating to the second point of interest, we snap a picture to find a bundle of spikes. The third point of interest seems to be a bunch of pipes coming out of the floor, or some sort of strange cylindrical formation. It's a little weird, but it's nothing to fuss about. But the fourth picture, we capture something weird. It's the face of a creature, and upon snapping another, it's gone. There is something else down here, something alive. But how could it be? If all life was snapped out of existence, it seems like these blood oceans hold more secrets than we know. Well, now that we know that something else is down here, we better hurry and get to our next position. Navigating our way to the fifth point of interest, we snap a picture to find a skeleton of some sort of large creature. It seems like its corpse has been here for a while. More proof of life surviving and thriving within the oceans of blood. But it's really when we make it to the sixth location that even more questions pop up. When we take our photo, we get back something that I could only describe as some sort of man-made structure or building with columns and windows. Just how is something like this down here? It seems like Moon 85 has more to it than first meets the eye. When we input Moon 85 at the terminal, we get this. This entry has been redacted. See Blood Oceans for more information. So we input Blood Oceans to find out more about this strange anomaly. It tells us that since the Quiet Rapture, an unexplained phenomena has been identified on four separate moons. Moon 85, which is the one we are now on, and Moon Z8 are the most notable locations as they are under control of the COI. Enough research has been conducted on the blood itself to determine that it is indeed human blood, but we have not discovered where it comes from or how it keeps its liquid form. At the bottom it reads, the oceans on 85 is of particular interest because, well, that changes everything. Why on hell would these blood oceans be made out of human blood? We input Moon Z8 to find out more. It tells us the site of one of four known blood oceans and one of two such moons under the control of the COI. Moon Z8 has historically been used for the realization of COI convictions until the discovery of Moon 85. Okay, we know this conviction realization is the reason why we are down here. When we ask it, it tells us that it is a form of humane criminal justice used by the COI where criminals are repaid by rendering service to the general collective. Often this is by performing surveys, maintenance, or other similar beneficiary tasks. When we ask it what the COI is, it tells us that it is one of the few organizations operating in the world. Their name stands for the Consolidation of Iron. It's a brotherhood of three space stations and two spacecrafts numbering 257 citizens in total. We get off the terminal and continue on our journey. After making it to the seventh location, we snap a picture to find more giant-sized bones. But as we make it to our eighth location, the closer we get, the more vibrations we feel in our submarine. It seems like the blood around us is boiling and our ship is heating up because of it. When we eventually make it and snap a picture, we get this, a bright light generating immense heated energy to shake our entire vessel like this. While navigating our way back, something bumps into us and we get moved by a few hundred meters away. After moving some more, our ship's sensors start going off as if there is a large structure around us. When we snap a picture to see what is in front of us causing this, we see this. Something is stalking us. We need to keep moving. But whatever that thing did to our ship created a hole in its structure. 
because before long, blood starts leaking in, slowly filling up the inside. But we only have one more point of interest. Maybe we can still make it. We finally get there, position ourselves for the final picture, and get ready to snap. But before we can do that, And that's Iron Lung. It looks like the secrets we uncovered on Moon 85 will forever stay unknown until another doomed convict is lowered down here to suffer the same fate as us. But what do our findings mean for the grander picture? Among the pictures we took, three of them seemed normal. Two of them are of dead animal bones and two are of live creatures, which may or may not be the same monster from the ending. One of them seems to be some sort of structure, and the last one is the bright light. Whatever that bright light was, it was extremely powerful, rocking our entire vessel. But the question still stands, why is the ocean made out of human blood? Are other oceans in the Iron Lung world similar? We know that there's at least three more out there, and perhaps even more undiscovered ones. But do they also have life within them? So many questions, yet so little answers. Iron Lung is a game I've been wanting to cover on the channel for a while now, but I never had good reason to. I'm glad to finally have had a chance to peek down the dark abyss that is the dead void of the Iron Lung universe. The games we cover today are all vastly different in their own kinds. While some can be a bit similar in their gameplay or genres, others set completely in different worlds. Yet to me, all these games share that same feeling. That feeling of being the only one left alive in a vast, empty, dying world. And I will see you very soon.